All right, so in this video, we're gonna talk about similar figures. Now, there are two types of geometry. There is what is known as analytic geometry and Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is pretty much the study of triangles, and then you have analytic geometry, which is the study of Cartesian points, you know, points that are numbers, um, you know, and angles that are related by um, what is known as the inner product space. What I'm just saying is, what I'm trying to get at is that we're going to take, in, throughout the course, we've been looking at Euclidean geometry, we're going to look more at the analytic part. We're going to look at uh, shapes other than just triangles. So let's do that. So similar figures. Um, as a review too, I want to talk about different um, isometries. An isometry, again, is just a distance preserving function that we've talked about um, so far in the class. So this right here is known as a translation. We take it, we move it. That's the uh, translation. We can reflect two triangles about a line. That would be a reflection. We can also rotate it counterclockwise or clockwise. So that's another um, isometry. And then glide reflections, my favorite, is where you come, it's like a combo. Um, you reflect it about some axis and then you um, glide it or translate it parallel to that axis. So those are the types of isometries. All right, so let's talk about, you know, translating shapes other than triangles that we may use in our everyday lives. Um, so there are two kind of examples I can kind of think of. One is with um, a baseball, you know, when you throw a knuckleball, so you throw a knuckleball and it comes off. And when the ball comes off your fingers, the ball does not spin at all. So, but it's moving up and down, you know, side to side and it's not spinning at all. It's just translating. So it's just going around like that. And when that happens, it's hard to hit the ball. So that's the, that's the knuckleball. So it's just translating. It's moving up and down side to side. It's going, you know, it can go diagonal. It's not spinning this way or this way, though. That would not, um, that would be rotating. So it's not doing that. Um, also with a soccer ball. Um, so some, if you take a soccer ball and you, you know, you kick down on it with your laces, some of those, uh, the way it comes off your foot is that the soccer ball will go through the air like this. So it goes through like this. And it's kind of like a knuckleball in baseball. And those are some of the most powerful kicks. So this is the most um, powerful uh, shot for a soccer ball. And um, notice how the ball is translating here. It's not going to spin. And let's watch this video right here. So let's watch. Two minutes for time. Staat het nog altijd 0-0 bijna val tegen Sporting Club de Portugal. Maar invaller Ronnie. You want to stand in the wall. Produceert hier een schitterende vrije trap. En zo wint de ploeg van Paulo Bento alsnog. It barely. So it, it, if it spun a little bit, if it rotated, the thing was like this. Okay, so it was going right through the air like that. Gets and it moves. All right, so it just it moves where it doesn't rotate at all through space. It just is moving. You can move it up, down, left, right. Now I'm trying to train you all to think of um, shapes as a bunch of points. So when you think about a cylinder, it's extra. It's beneficial to think of a cylinder as you know just covered with points. Okay. Now an isometry is, is it's not just an, uh, I'm sorry, a similar, a similar transformation. All right. I'm going to take that back. A similar transformation is not just an isometry. You know, we were talking about isometries before a similar transformation also includes stretching, getting bigger and shrinking, getting smaller. So a stretch would be where we take it and we make it bigger. A shrink is where we take a figure and we make it smaller. We reduce it. All right, let's go over some uh, similarity transformations. A similarity transformation is a function. Okay, so th there's my function. It's called, we're going to call it f of x. So here f of x is a function which maps points in space to each other. All right, let's see what I mean by that. So here's my um, shape over here on the left. And then what happens is, is this shape gets mapped to what is known as an image. It's called the image. So it gets mapped to the image. What we call the shape on the left is the pre-image. So we call that shape the pre-image. 
So the mapping here of your function is from the pre-image to the image. Now we're going to see the mapping right here. So there's my point P. What happens is, is that point is mapped to F of P, and we call that point P prime. So the symbol here, a lot of times in math gets used, we call that P prime. So that's what that point would be called in the transformation. So F of P is equal to P prime. There's my point Q. Now that point Q is also gonna to correspond to where it would in the other diagram, same spot. So F of Q is equal to Q prime. So that's where that uh, point would be located. Now let's take another point. And that point is on the lower left-hand side of that cylinder. That point would be mapped to, if it was R, we would call that R prime, or we would just call that F of R. So th that's what's going on here. We're seeing all these points are being mapped by this function. Now I wanna look at a triangle. We just chose three arbitrary points along both of those figures, and I'm gonna extract a triangle, and we're gonna take a look at it, a closer look at it. There's a triangle on the left in my pre-image, and there's a triangle on my right, the image. Okay, so let's look at that. Notice that the angles of the pre-image and the image are the same respectively. So P and F of P, those angles, you see the number of angle arcs are both one. For Q and F of Q or Q prime, we see two angle arcs. And at R and F of R in the image, those both have three angle arcs and they have the same measure as far as their angles go, respectively, which is kind of interesting. A similarity transformation is an angle preserving function. That's very important. And that goes for all shapes. If you take those three points and it gets mapped in that way, it is known as an angle preserving function. So that's the reason. So if we say two triangles are similar, why are their angles um, equal, respectively speaking? It's because it is an angle preserving function. And we'll go into why that is. Okay, so that's not the full story. Why is it an angle preserving function? There's more to that story as to why that works. All right, so now it's time for a definition. Similarity transformation, let's. All right, so the definition states that for some value K greater than zero, so you have some real number that's greater than zero. It is common to use the uh, letter K here. K stands for your scale factor. Notice it is a value greater than zero, so your scale factor cannot be negative. Um, so for some value k greater than zero, it states that k times the distance from point P to Q, this stands for D, stands for distance from P to Q. So that's what that notation means right there. It states that if you have k times the distance from P to Q, that must be equal to the distance from P prime to Q prime for any point between our transformation here from our pre-image to our image, our image to our pre-image. That's what the definition states. Um, so let's break that apart. Let's say I have a scale factor. The scale factor, let's say it's K and it's equal to three. So K is three here. It's greater than zero, so we're good. So let's denote that number three right under K. So K is our scale factor, it's three here. Um, let's say I have some points in my pre-image, P and Q. They correspond in the image to points P prime and Q prime. So P and Q correspond to P prime and Q prime by the function f of x. Now, let's say our distance from P to Q is two centimeters. We just measure that distance out from P to Q. That distance is two centimeters, took a ruler. So the distance from P to Q is two centimeters. Let's denote that right under you know, our function there. So I'm putting that number right there. That number, so three times two is six. So the distance from P prime to Q prime must be equal to six centimeters. So if I look at my image here, P prime and Q prime, that distance between those function, between those uh, points there must be six centimeters. So if I took a ruler 
The similarity transformation states that distance must be six centimeters. That better be six centimeters. So that's what that definition means. Now, I also wanted to talk about why the scale factor cannot be negative. It's a value that is greater than zero. Okay, so I, a lot of people say that it can be negative. I'm going to write why it can't be. Why it doesn't even make sense to talk about it being negative here. If you look at the, our definition right here, a distance function, you know, whenever you talk about a distance function, it states that this value right here must be greater than or equal to zero. It could be zero, but nine times out of 10, this distance from P to Q, it's always going to be positive. It could be zero, but nine times out of 10, it's going to be a positive number. Where these points right here are, are distinct, you know, this value is going to be positive. Now, if K was a negative number, you'd have a negative value right there. So you'd have a negative number times a positive number would be equal to a negative number. And it does not make sense to talk about the distance from P prime to Q prime being negative here. So this means that this situation K saying it's a negative number really doesn't make sense to talk about it being negative. All right, so what's important here is that you take every point in our pre-image, you map it to our values in our image, and you're multiplying those values by our scale factor. All right, so the main idea, let's get into that. All respective sides, what that means is that all respective sides are in proportion to each other. You're multiplying it by, you're multiplying all the sides in the pre-image by a, a specific number to yield the distance in the image. All right, now let's talk about um, similarity transformations in the context of um, ratios. Um, what, what we're gonna see is that their ratios are the same. So let's, let's show why that is. Let's say we have a scale factor here and the scale factor is K and let's say that's number is nine. So the distance from P to Q, let's, let's not include units here. The distance from P to Q, let's have that number be one. So one times nine is nine. So in the image, that number would be nine. The distance from Q to R, let's say it's six. Six times nine would be 54. It'd be 54 right there. Let's say we had the value um, four there. Four times nine is 36. So that last remaining side would also be 36. So let's look at our two triangles here and let's get into why their ratios are the same. Um, ratios, you know, a lot of times when you think of ratios, nine colon two, we think of that as the number nine divided by two. All right, so this, you have our colon here, we're thinking about ratios like that. But what happens when you talk about, um, you know, where you have the situation with three colons? Well, that's a little different situation you got going on here. So let's talk about that. Um, so we see the distance from P prime to Q prime, you know, here, I'm looking at my image here in my um, slide right here. The distance from P prime to Q prime is nine. So that number is nine. So I'm getting that number nine from there. Um, and then the distance from um, Q prime to R prime is 54. So I'm going to take that number. I'm going to extract that value. I'm going to put that value there. And then for my last colon, um, R prime to P prime, that value is 36. I'm extracting that value. I'm getting it from there. So I have the values 9, 54, and 36. Now what I can do with these values right here, I can multiply every single one of these values by uh, a number as long as it's not zero. I can multiply these values by a number and their ratios would still be the same. So what I'm gonna, I could multiply these values by a specific number or I could divide those values by a specific number. And it's actually related by the scale factor here. So I'm gonna take every single one of my values and I'm gonna divide that value by nine. So I can divide each of these by nine without affecting the ratio. So nine divided by nine is one, so I'm gonna write so I'm dividing every single term here by nine. Nine divided by nine is one. 54 divided by nine, that middle term is six. So I put a six and 36 divided by nine is four. So I get four right there. So that's the ratio right there. So it's one, six, four. One to six to four. Colons, 
Whenever you read a colon, you read that for a ratio. Oh, that was like a weird colon. If you have a colon, it, you would say two. So that's the, that's the um, vernacular right there. So one to six to four. Um, so the, for the pre-image P to Q, if you look at the distance, so we're looking at the distance on, on our uh, figure on our left here for our pre-image. The distance from P to Q is one. Okay, so I put one. The distance from, I'm getting that value from right there. The distance from Q to R is six. So I'm gonna put that value right there. I'm getting that value from right here. So six is coming from there. And then last but not least, the distance from R to P, that value is four. I'm getting that value from there. Notice the ratios from our um, image and our pre-image. There are now one to six to four. They're the same thing. They are equal. The reason they are equal is due to our scale factor. Okay, so the important thing is that ratios are equal between our pre-image and our image and vice versa. Their sides at least. All right, now let's go into how we would determine a scale factor if it was not already given. All right, so the scale factor is defined to be, so I wrote that out here, we always call it K. So K is equal to the distance in the image over the distance in the pre-image. So the distance in the image here, it, it doesn't matter which side we use. So let's, let's look at, um, let's just be a little, let's be a little bit different here. So R prime to Q prime up top. So that distance is 54. So for the numerator, we would have it be 54. Now in the denominator, the distance from R to Q, we see a six. So we also represent that as six. So what's important, and you're seeing this go on here, is that the distance in the image is always in the, in the numerator up top. The distance in the pre-image where that corresponds to is in the denominator. So here, our scale factor would be nine because I'm taking what is in the numerator to be the distance in the image and then what is in the denominator to be the distance in the pre-image. So 54 divided by six is nine and that's how we would tell what the scale factor is. So you just take the, um, the figure on the you know, side of the, the right side of the arrow and you take that number and you put that in the numerator and then the value in the denominator is on the other side where it corresponds to. And you just divide them out. All right, so let's talk about some other important aspects about the scale factor. Let's say we have a scale factor. You know, we have the situation where K is one. This means that the image did not change um, size. So this is an example where, you know, P, the distance from P to Q is two centimeters. The scale factor would be one. And we notice that it did not change size at all. So from the distance from P prime to Q prime is also two centimeters. So it did not change size. Now the distance in the image here is two centimeters and the distance in the pre-image on the left is also two. So that means that K would be equal to one here. So when K is one, the image did not change size. It did not get bigger or smaller. What do we call that? We call that an, what is known as a distance preserving function where our distance doesn't change at all. It's known as an isometry, a congruence transformation. So when K is one, we have that congruence transformation. That is isometric. Another one. If K is greater than one, then the image is larger than the pre-image. So it's getting bigger. And we call that an enlargement. It gets bigger, it's larger. Enlargement, larger. All right, so if K is greater than one, then the image is going to be more spread out than the pre-image. And this would be an example here. Now notice here, and I'm, I'm gonna say this right away, you don't have to memorize this. You don't have to memorize that if K is greater than one, then you have an enlargement. Think about it conceptually. 
Okay, k is defined to be the distance in the image over the distance in the pre-image. Now, if we look at the distance in the image, that distance is huge. The numerator is ginormous. It is 300. The distance in the pre-image is just the measly two. So it's not anything at all. And if you think about the numerator being like 10 gajillion, and you're dividing it by a number that's not very large, that number is going to be pretty pretty big, pretty significant. So k will be a value that will be greater than one. So whenever you have that situation where the numerator is large and the denominator is small, understand that k will be greater than one in that situation. The last one, if k is less than one, then the image is said to be smaller than the pre-image. And what this is known as, it's known as a reduction. So right here in our pre-image, this is the transformation from our pre-image to our image here will be known as a reduction. We see that the distance from P to Q is 10,000 miles. And the distance from P prime to Q prime is only five inches. Again, notice what happens for the distance in the pre-image, it becomes huge. That value becomes drastically large. And whenever you take a number and you divide it by a huge value in the denominator, that value becomes closer and closer to zero. So what happens here, if I, if I for instance, like 10 divided by 100,000, that number is gonna be close to zero. So the value in the de denominator gets large, larger and larger. And what happens to K is that it gets smaller and smaller. So K becomes less than one. And that's the way you want to think of it with this one. All right. Now let's get into this. Which scale factor would be most appropriate here? All right. So what we see on the left on our pre-image is a little sailboat. And on the right, a ginormous sailboat. It's probably a cruise ship. But let's just assume we have that valid transformation here. Which scale factor would be most appropriate? Does anyone know, and, and if, you've, if you've never seen that notation for K, let's say K was 1 e to the fourth. That notation signifies, it's very common to use that, 1 e to the fourth stands for 1 times 10 to the fourth power. That's what that stands for. So that number really is equal to, it just tells you how many zeros you have. So when I say it's one e to the fourth, that tells me how many zeros I have. So I would count one, two, three, four zeros. And looking at option E here, three e to the negative 10th power, what that signifies is the number three times 10 to the minus 10 power. And what this value does is it signifies how many values I move to the left. So if I start at three, and there's my decimal right here, I count out 10 units to the left. It's getting smaller. So I go one, two, three, and I keep going on and on, 10, and then I put the decimal right there. You see that number is extremely small. Okay, so there's, I moved at 10 units to the left here. All right, so that value is extremely small. Now, first off, is this an enlargement or a reduction? It is an enlargement. We're getting a lot bigger here. Now, does that ship look 20 times as large you know looking at our small ship in the bottle if i multiplied the length of that thing times 20 would that yield my ship in the image no it would be it would be much larger than that so what scale factor would be most appropriate here i would have to go with option a option a is a large number that has four zeros after the one 
So for the first one, the scale factor that would be most appropriate would be option A. All right, let's go into question two. Which scale factor would be most appropriate here? Is the camel on the picture on the left, it's, you know, it's larger than the picnic table. Is it going to be, are we going to take the length of that thing and multiply it times 1e to the fourth? I would, I would, I would not say that that camel on the figure on the right is going to be that large. No, I would not say that. What about k is 20? If I took its, you know, it, the length of its, in, its body all the way up to its head, is the length going to be 20 times as large as the camel on the left? No, that would be huge still. 20 times as large is a significant increase. I mean, that camel would be ginormous in that way. I mean, that's like more than 20 picnic tables. So it would not be 20 as well. In fact, I would have to go with option C here. Option C would be the most appropriate. So I would say K would be equal to one. That scale factor would be most appropriate. It's not like the camel's getting smaller in this diagram. It's about one here. All right, let's look at the turtle. So we have uh, mama turtle on the left in the pre-image. And in the image, we have baby turtle. Okay, same turtle, it just gets smaller. What is smaller known as? An enlargement, reduction, or isometric transformation. It's reducing in size, so it's called a reduction here. Now, if we look at our turtle, I would say it's about, you know, if I took that thing and I, I looked at its, the, the length of that thing, I would say it's about 25%, you know, of that length. I took that thing and I cut it and, you know, looked at a fourth of it, 25%, I would say that's about what that, um, the smaller turtle would be. So for this one, I would say the scale factor here would be option D. All right, let's look at this one. Oh, one more. Which scale factor would be most appropriate here? It's clearly not an enlargement. It's not an isometry because the distance from the picture on the, on, you know, the, the diagram on the left in the pre-image versus an atom, the real thing, you know, you can't even see an atom. It is becoming so small here. The smallest scale factor here would be option E. You're counting 10 units from the, from the value right here on our three. We're moving 10 units to the left. I'm counting one, two, three, and I'm going 10 units and I'm at 10, I'm ending here. That's an extremely small number. So for this one, I would say the scale factor that is most appropriate here is option E. We're taking that model and we're reducing it a kajillion times. We're getting it smaller, okay? So that option would be E here. All right, now let's take a closer look at triangles. Let's go over some reasons as to why triangles, triangle ABC would be similar to triangle A prime, B prime, C prime. And these work kind of beautifully with each other. The first reason, so, and these are very important reasons, I would definitely write this down, is known as SSS similarity. So we would write SSS and then write that um, squiggle symbol right there. So that is known as SSS similarity. What this means is that all three sides of the triangle are related by a scale factor. So the scale factor here we see it would be equal to K because all the values, you know, in the image, A prime, B prime, if we took those values and we put that in the numerator and we put all the, the distances in the denominator for in the uh, pre-image, that would be the scale factor for each of their sides. And when each of their sides are equal to each other, that is known as SSS similarity. Okay. But let's get rid of K because it depends on which way you're looking at the transformation. You know, if you're looking at it from the pre-image to the image, or if you're looking at it from the image to the pre-image, it, it, it's a situational event, one could say. So SSS similarity. SAS similarity. 
would be where two sides are directly proportional to each other and you have a shared angle between them. The angle that is shared between them has the same measure. We'll get into these examples in a little bit. And last but not least, the last reason for why two triangles would be similar. So the reason would be angle angle similarity. The A's stand for angles and the S's stand for sides here. So side angle side. And what you should notice is that these relationships here are related to, they're very similar to congruence. You know, there's SSS as far as a, being a congruent transformation. But here it's a little bit different. It's where all the sides are just multiplied by a number. And SAS is the same thing. You're multiplying all the sides by a number, but you have that shared angle with the same value between them. And last but not least, you have that angle angle similarity situation where two angles or three angles um, are equal to each other. And that's the last situation. The angle angle is kind of a curveball. It's a little bit different. So make sure you pay attention to that one. So that's an important one. All right. And, and again, on the previous side, the reason why, you know, all of those things were um, so like side, 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 angle, side, angle, angle, similarity, they actually are equivalent definitions. Um, you can prove that those reasons are in fact equivalent um, by using um, analytic geometry, but we're not going to get into that. So those are reasons why um, triangles would be um, similar. So, all right, let's get on to question five here. So is triangle ABC similar to triangle DEF? If so, what is the reason? So we see 13 and 26, that's one side, 12, 24, another side, 10 and 20, that's another side. So right here, we're thinking side, side, side uh, similarity. We're, we're thinking all of those sides are um, in proportion, the same scale factor to each other. So I'm going to guess SSS similarity right away. But we have to prove that. You know, it's not good enough to just say SSS similarity because they look like all, there are three sides here. We have to actually show that. So what I did was I, you know, I started drawing off this uh, triangle um, right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you know, and it is important to um, even denote, you know, the arrow. So from here to here, um, it matters because this is the pre-image, that's the image. Um, this will be the reciprocal of it if you're going the other way. So it's important to denote that arrow right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 26 divided by 13. I'm going to take 24 divided by 12. And I'm going to take 20 divided by 10. So I'm matching up the sides, you know, 26, 13, 24, 12, 20, and 10. And if those numbers are all equal, you know, when I divide them, then, you know, we're good. So let's see that right here. So, um, so there's my arrow again. If I take, you know, 26 divided by 13, you know, upper right, 24, 12, lower, and 20 divided by 10. All right, let's see if those are. So 26 divided by 13, all right, is 2. 24 divided by 12 is 2. 20 divided by 10, they're all 2. All right, so they're all equal. So this means that SSS similarity does work because 2 equals 2 equals 2. They all are equal. They're all, all the sides here, you know, correspondingly are proportional to each other by the same number, uh, that scale factor. So the reason for SSS similarity holds true. So those triangles are similar by SSS similarity. All right, let's go on to the next example. Is triangle ABC similar to triangle DEF? If so, what is the reason? I don't see any angles here, so I'm going to say the reason that these triangles are similar is by SSS similarity. That's our guess to start. We don't know for sure. But that's what I'm going to assume here, because we don't see any angles even associated here. So we see three sides. So there's my arrow, very important arrow. It allows the reader to um, understand what you're looking at as far as the pre-image and the image go. Again, I'm going to take every value in the image and I'm going to divide it by the value in the pre-image where it corresponds to. So I'm going to go 15 divided by 10, 6 divided by 4, and 8 divided by 5, moving around um, clockwise in that manner. 
Now, if you look at 15 divided by 10, we're going to reduce all these fractions here to make sure this holds true. So I take 15, I divide it by the number 5, and 10, I divide it by the same number, 5. And those, the numerator and denominator, so 15 divided by 5 is the number 3. And 10 divided by 5 is equal to the number 2. So that fraction, 15 divided by 10, really is equal to 3 to over 2. Now let's look at um, 6 and 4. Let's go on to the next one. I can divide the numerator and denominator both here by 2 to yield an integer. So when I do that, 6 divided by 2 is 3 up top, and 4 divided by 2 is 2 in the denominator. So I see a 3 and a 2 there. So I'm reducing that fraction and I get that. So that value is also 3 over 2. Our scale factor is 3 over 2 for both of those sides. Now let's look at that last one, 8 over 5. That value is already reduced. That value does not equal 3 over 2. That value cannot be reduced because 5 is a prime number. We cannot divide it by anything to yield an integer, any, any, um, any integer value to yield another integer. So it's already reduced. So what that means is that this equation where they're all equal, that does not work. Nope, they're not all equal because that does not equal eight over five, nope. So our reason here does not work. Side, side, side similarity does not hold true. And in fact, that means that these triangles are not similar. All right, let's look at this example here. Is triangle ABC similar to triangle DEF? It's the same way. We're looking at it, at every single one of these. All right, so what we see is a shared angle here. So we see a side, that eight and two, the angle, which is the same measure, and then we see a side, the six and the 1.5 corresponding to each other. So if I was gonna guess, I would say that this transformation here will be side angle side. Notice, when I take 2 and I multiply that value by 4, the scale factor by 4, that gives me 8. So if I multiply 2 by 4, that will give me 8. If I take 1.5 and I multiply that value by 4 as well, that will give me 6. So those sides are proportional to each other by the same number, directly proportional, by 4. That checks out with that. So that means the sides work, the two sides. And then we see the angle in the middle. And that is the same measure. That is known as side angle side similarity here. Again, our scale factor is four. We see the side angle and the side. That is known as side angle side similarity when they're proportional like that. So that works. So those triangles would be similar by side angle side. All right, let's look at this example here. Now I, here I just see, see, you know, two angles. I see angle A and B. Angle A and D, they're congruent. They have the equal measure and B and E also are congruent, they have equal measure. So here, these triangles would simply be congruent by angle, angle, similarity. And notice, we could even make this triangle larger or smaller. We don't know here, but they're proportional, those sides are, but, the, but these triangles are similar by angle, angle, similarity. All right, so this example is asking us, um, it's a multiple choice question, it's wanting to know which option is true. Um, when are two polygons similar? Option A is that, so it's a multiple choice here. Option A states two polygons are similar if their sides are proportional, so they're all in proportion to each other, by a scale factor going around either counterclockwise or clockwise. So here I, are, I made an example for option A, and the reason for it is I'm wanting to show what I mean by going around counterclockwise or clockwise, what that means. That means, and the reason that this is important and has to deal with orientation of the shape. So right here, okay, so I'm gonna go around clockwise. So I'm going 
1 times 1 is 1. So that's, it's in proportion, I'm starting here. So 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 is, times 1 is 1. So I went around clockwise, I went through the whole thing, and all the sides were in proportion to each other. Now, what's the shape called on the left side that I drew? It's called a rhombus. Very good. It's a rhombus because all the sides, all the sides of this quadrilateral are equal. It's also a parallelogram too, as a side note, because these sides, opposite sides, are congruent, so it is a parallelogram. Now, so is this a similar transformation now? Is this a similar transformation? Not necessarily, because this angle right here, just looking at our diagram here, let's say that was 30 degrees. Okay. Let's say that was 30 degrees. A similar transformation is an angle preserving function. Are these the same angle? No, they are not. So this is not a similar transformation. So option A is sadly not correct. All right, let's look at option B. Option B states two polygons are similar if their angles correspond to each other, so their angles um, are corresponding to each other and are equal in measure going around counterclockwise or clockwise. So there, there's a correspondence of all the angles being equal to each other going around clockwise or counterclockwise. All right. See an example of this one. All right, let's start off with a fancy rectangle. And with this fancy rectangle, a rectangle can in fact be a square this rectangle is not going to be a square this rectangle I'm defining these side lengths to be different let's say I have a transformation and this became a square I'm making them all 90 here too all right so Let's look at our two diagrams here. So we have some kind of transformation. T, we're wanting to see if it's a similar transformation. All right, this one has to deal with angles. Let's go around clockwise here. 90 equal, 90 equal, 90 equal, 90 equal. I went around, all of their angles were equal. Is this a similar transformation? No, it's not. And the reason it's not a similar transformation is because we see, let's say, our scale factor there must be 1. These are different lengths. So our scale factor is not 1 for this other side. All the side lengths have to be in proportion to each other, and this, kind of, this messes it up right here. So, no, this is not a, uh, a similar transformation. So B is a no-go. Let's look at option C. Option C states two polygons are similar if their sides and angles measured around clockwise or counterclockwise are equal, are equal, oh, okay, let me start, uh, start this over again. If their sides and angles measured around counterclockwise or clockwise are proportional, so are their sides all in proportion to each other, and are equal in measure respectively, so are, are all the angles going to be equal? respectively if I go around either counterclockwise or clockwise here. So I'm going to try my best to draw this diagram here. All right, so this is a trapezoid kind of looking diagram over here. So I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to rotate it a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. Um, all right, now for this example, what I'm going to say is it's going to look like these sides are equal in fact i'm going to say that they are not equal i'm going to say that this means that they are in proportion to each other there sadly is not a notation for sides being in proportion to each other the reason why there isn't a notation for it is because who really cares that the sides are proportional because we want to make sure all the sides are proportional by the same scale factor so just because two sides are proportional it doesn't really mean much in that way all right, so right here, let's say those sides are in proportion to each other. Um, 
we have this angle and this angle being equal. This side and this side are in proportion to each other. You have this angle and this angle being equal. This side and this side. Again, this is not meaning that they're congruent. It's just referring to proportionality. Um, I go one, two, three angle arcs, one, two, three, and then one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's a lot of angle arcs. Three, four. Okay. So the question is, are these polygons similar? All right. So this one is kind of a trick. It, it's, it's tricky. All right. Now what I'm going to say with this one is that I'm going to take this figure here and I'm going to have a transformation and I'm going to lay that T. I'm going to have a transformation and I'm going to lay it directly on top of that other one. And this could be in proportion to it. And I'm, this is what I mean by this. This side is in proportion to that side. So what I'm going to do with this side is I'm going to take this side here. I'm going to multiply it by my scale factor, whatever it is, K. And it's going to give me this side. And I'm going to start here. I'm going to extend it the length of that side. So it goes all the way down here. Now this angle is a certain measure going over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this side over here. Now I'm going to start over here. I'm going to go whatever. I'm going to crank it down 10 degrees. I'm going to take it down, crank it down 10 degrees. I'm going to take this side and I'm going to also multiply it by that scale factor. So it's now, I'm going to lay it directly on top of the other one. I'm going to go take this one. I'm going to continue that angle over. I'm going to take this side and I'm going to multiply it by its scale factor. So it lays directly on top of that. And then from here, well, what we see is that it doesn't really, well, we have that other angle, but it doesn't help much to define it from here because it has to close it off. But we have these other sides and this side right here and this side, it must be in proportion to itself. So it closes off right there. And this figure laid directly on top of that other one. Now we see a transformation where I took this, our pre-image, and I laid it directly on top of the other image. All of the side lengths are in proportion to each other. And it was an angle preserving function. So that would in fact be a similarity transformation. All right. So I hope that example helped there. All right. So this question is kind of, I like these questions here. All right. So this is what happens to the perimeter of a shape given a scale factor that is K. So you have some kind of transformation. It's a similarity transformation. It's scale factor. Let's just say it's two. You have some kind of scale factor. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, actually, let's make it be K for here. Um, it says what happens to the scale um, to the perimeter of the shape and you know, I want to talk about this and it's more general than just even like a finite of a polygon. It could be relatable to even curves, you know, uh, where you're going like this. So, all right. The question is, and this is, this is a good example. So if I take a ruler here and I wanted to measure the distance, the, you know, the length of that, um, you know, that curve right here, what you might think is that, well, is this a good measurement? You know, if I go from here to here and I just say it's nine inches, no, cause it's, it's, it's a curve. So I need to go, this would be the, it's much longer than that. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to chop up this curve into smaller um, pieces, which are all almost like lines and move across this figure to, you know, approximate what that, um, distances. If I'm just going to use a ruler here to measure that, the perimeter of that shape in inches, I'd have to say, well, this is one inch, you know, this is a, uh, this is one inch right here. Um, this is one inch, you know, keep on going through this thing. So you keep on doing that process repeatedly, but what happens is so, and if I was going to take all my lengths here, length one, length two, length three, you know, so on and so forth. And then I have whatever length, uh, 10, whatever. What I do is I, I take all these, you know, these straight lines. Okay. So I, I take them all and then you see what this is. You see this approximation of this curve here. So you know that the perimeter of this shape would be L1 plus L2 plus L3, I'm dot, 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 plus, you know, L10, 
you know you keep it's a it's approximately that the perimeter now if you look at the similar transformation what happens is is that all of these values it, this point right here is k times the length of whatever that um, straight line was right here so this would be kl1 and this right here would be kl2 because it's taking those two points and it's mapping them in space so it's k times that so all of these values now over here you know are being mapped over here and then it goes all the way you know so on and so forth to kl10 and if we we're going to look at this diagram here we would see it would be kl1 plus kl2 um, and there's finitely many um, for this example so plus kl10 now, so this is the perimeter approximately of the image right here. Um, that's the symbol for approximately, by the way. Now, this is the, so this is for the pre-image. This is of the image. Now, what I can do here is take out, I can factor out a K. So it's KL1 plus L2 plus whatever, you know, plus L10. In other words, this value right here is really K times this value right here is really approximately the perimeter so it's the perimeter so if you have a um you know and you're looking at your premature image you see that your scale factor right here it's actually so the perimeter of this shape if you know it you know and it goes around as a curve you just multiply the perimeter of that shape by k to find the perimeter of that shape right there all right, now this example is going over what happens to the surface area of a shape when you have a scale factor that is, you know, that is K here. So I have a surface here and I'm taking it and I'm having the transformation be this. I'm reducing it. The scale factor would be less than one here. Now, the notation here is that, and I wanted you to see it. You don't write this ever in math like, like this, but a lot of times when you put it on your calculator or you do something like that, this caret symbol means it's the same thing as writing k squared so when you're on your paper that's what that means it's it's saying k times k so here what happens is that every single what you do when you have a surface is you have essentially these small little rectangles that you can partition a surface with so you break them up in all these little um equally you know equally spaced rectangles this area has a certain area you could determine what that is this shape has a certain area you could determine what that is and then you know you keep on continually continuing and you have you know a shape over here which is another a small square over here and if you were wanting to figure out the total area of this entire shape you would just take up all these little you know areas you know throughout this whole thing you would add them all up it would be approximately equal to you know and it continues on through whatever it, it's uh, infinitely many but all right so it ends on whatever that is so what you do here is you have this shape here and then what happens is is that every single one of these rectangles if these were all the same length so if this one was had a length L and a width W, it gets mapped to a, a rectangle here with a length KL and a width KW. So this area of this shape right here, this rectangle must be, if they were all the same, um, every rectangle is the same. Here, I might rectangle we're considering is the same so if we look at um, so this rectangle here corresponds to that one so this would be the area would be K um, actually here let's look at this this would be KL times KW so the area of that rectangle would be KL times KW which is equal to k squared l w which is equal to k squared a all right so all of the areas are the same here so it's k squared times a so 
In other words, this rectangle A1 corresponds to that one over here because they're all the same. So this would be K um, squared times A1 because all the rectangles are all the same. This rectangle here would also do the same. It would be K squared times whatever that one would be. Um, they all get mapped to the same thing. So what happens here is that the area of this shape is equal to k squared a1 plus k squared a2 and then plus dot 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 plus k squared um, a. So the area we can factor out the k squared from it. So and this area of this value right here, that would be the area of your pre-image. So what happens with your area going from here to here, you see that the surface area of the pre-image times k squared. So the surface area of the image right here, the area of the image is equal to k squared times the area of the pre-image. So that's what um, that answer is for that question. All right, now this question is wanting to know what happens to the volume of a shape given a scale factor that is um, k. So what happens to the volume of the shape? Um, this is, again, this is why, so let's say you have a volume that is 36 inches cubed. This is why, um, so if you have 36 inches cubed and you're wanting to figure out how many feet it is, so you know that 12 inches are in one foot. This is why you end up, you know, cubing the term here. There's a relationship between this idea and so what happens is, is you have your units here. 12 inches cubed is uh, 12 cubed inches cubed. And then one cubed, you have one cubed foot cubed. What I'm saying is that to convert between these ideas, it's the same um, concept here. This is why you're cubing your values. So if you have a scale factor, you know, going from inches to feet, your scale factor is um, going from inches to feet would be one over 12. So, but okay, so if you had, at any rate, so it would be, you're taking it, you know, you're essentially, you're cubing it, just how I had it there. So if you have a shape here and you're wanting to figure out what the volume is, you can take of this sphere, you can take these little rectangular um, prisms and you can take up all their volume. So you can just sum of all, uh, they're known as cuboids. It's a fancy word. You could also call it a cuboid. Um, it would be, so if this was the length this is the width and this was the height. You know that if you took a, a cuboid over here and you had all of its values, it's mapped in space over here, you know that this distance from here to here would be K times your length, K times your width, and lastly, K times your height. Um, so your value here of this rectangle would be, so the volume here just of that rectangle would be the length times the width times the height. And then for this, and I keep calling it a rectangle, I should really quit calling it a rectangle because it's, you know, you have that other component, that other dimension. But so you have this KL times, you're going length here. So the length would be KL times KW times KH. Uh, that is equal to K, you see one, two, three, K cubed L W H. Um, so you see that you're taking, and if we were going to add all of these components up, if we we're going to sum all those values, you're actually, you're cubing your final value at the end of the day. So volume of image is equal to k cubed and then you would have a bunch of these so you just add them out you factor up the 
um, k cubed is equal to k cubed times the um, volume of your pre-image. These are huge concepts. Um, you know, there are a lot of um, aspects that you can use these for the real world. And I just want to make sure everyone had those. All right. So.